Okay, welcome back everyone of the, of the lunch. I hope everyone had a nice break and maybe looked at some of the YouTube videos on the talks for this upcoming session on fish biology and ecology. And first up today um, in this afternoon session, we have a colleague joining from the University of Toronto, Nick Mandrak. His lab conducts research on the biodiversity and conservation of freshwater fishes. And Nick and Willoff has collaborated since 2013. And you'll hear a little bit more about this collaboration in, in, Nick, in Nick's talk now. And they've also co-supervised quite a few the research of few of the several graduate students, both in Canada and in, in South Africa. So thank you, Nick, for being present today and, and doing a little talk for us on your collaboration with Willoff and a, a research paper one of the, that came out at the end of last year um, on the 10 research questions in inland fisheries and, and fish in, in southern Africa. Nick, are you there? Yes, Hi. hello. Hi. Great to join you. From, thanks, Wynand. Uh, greetings from a uh, still dark Canada. Uh, it's, it's morning here. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for attending my talk. Let me just uh, get my slides up. And if you could just confirm you can see my slides because I can't see you now. Yes. Yeah, we can okay. see your slides, okay. so you can go ahead. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Wynand, and also I'd like to thank the South African Society of Aquatic Scientists for inviting me to present this talk in tribute to my colleague and friend, Dr. Olaf Weil. Uh, earlier this year, SIAB and the World Fisheries Congress invited me to give Olaf's keynote talk at the Congress on his behalf, and I readily accepted. My talk today is the main body of the Congress plenary. Apologies to those who have already seen it. I actually had um, I actually had an opportunity to talk to Olaf about his plenary talk last February uh, while I was visiting him in South Africa. We were fishing at the time, and Olaf asked me, "What should I do?" My uh, Congress plenary on. And uh, I said, uh, of course, we should be, uh, you should be talking about our upcoming 10 questions paper uh, that was currently in, in review at the time and was subsequently uh, published er earlier this year. And in fact, uh, this is the paper that was published. Uh, in fact, Olaf had uh, completed correcting the proofs for this paper, uh, which I believe will become a very important paper in, in South African fisheries shortly before he died. I started the keynote uh, talking about Olaf for those in the global fisheries community who did not know him. After the talk, the moderator indicated that comments flooded in on what a great scientist and person Olaf was. I could not have agreed more. Not surprisingly, Olaf was, was broadly known among the global fisheries community. As many of you, as many of you knew Olaf or heard about him over the past year and know much about his professional life, particularly as a mentor to and a, and a colleague of many of you, I will not repeat most of my memorial to him uh, that I gave at the Congress and, and earlier. Uh, but I did want to briefly tell you about my relationship with Olaf, a story that some of you already know, so apologies in advance. First met Olaf in 2013. Several Canadian colleagues and I were invited to participate in the Center of Invasion Biology an Annual Conference in Stellenbosch. Soon after receiving the invitation, we received an email from an Olaf file inviting us to visit him at SIAB prior to the CIB meeting. A Google search led me to conclude that we had very re similar research interests, and I quickly accepted Olaf's invitation. While we were waiting for our luggage in Port Elizabeth, I wondered aloud if we would recognize Olaf and he us. 
he assured me that we would know Olaf when we uh, see him. On cue, Olaf appeared and welcomed us as we were, as if we were already the good friends we were to become. While jet lag was weighing us down on our trip to Grahamstown, Olaf was buoying us with a fascinating commentator commentary on the country that we are traveling through. Our first stop was uh, Nanaga Farmstall, and sorry for the pronounce the uh, Canadian pronunciation. Uh, for lunch, now a ritual whenever we visit Makanda. The next two days were filled with simulating conversations, fascinating road trips, and ample food and drink, including a memorable addo picnic with smoked African sharp-toothed catfish. The good conversations and good times continued in Stellenbosch, and we parted ways as many academics do, agreeing that we should work together sometime, as often as not as simply a courteous goodbye. Over the course of the following year, we worked together on a rainbow trout case study for Dara's Wicked Papers, uh, Wicked Problems paper, and continued to discuss work together. By January 2015, I was back in South Africa with a couple of Canadian graduate students in tow to work in the series area with Olaf students. Once we got the students, as Olaf would say, sorted, we flew to Kruger to discuss fishery projects with Llewellyn and Robin, members of Olaf's vast network of collaborators. During that visit, Olaf and I spent a lot of time together and really got to know one another. Uh, we had a lot in common. We both had two daughters, loved our adopted countries, and enjoyed large linen, gin and tonics, cold beers, and outdoor cooking, me barbecuing, uh, Olaf frying. We also had some differences too. Olaf was a morning person, me a night person. Sorry, Albert, that's why I did not make your talk this morning. It was before a.m. our time. I couldn't quite get used to having a full English breakfast at 4 a.m. in the morning before a game drive. Olaf, the fun-loving extrovert, me, the more reserved introvert. Olaf visited me again in Canada later uh, in 2015, and we went to the American Fishery Society meeting in Portland, Oregon. And they visited again in 2016 when we, we went to the um, International Conference for Aquatic Invasive Species in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where Olaf gave a uh, keynote presentation. By the way, there will be a session dedicated to Olaf at the uh, ICASE meeting in Belgium in 2022. I visited Olaf twice in 2018, including for this conference uh, in, at Cape St. Francis, uh, where we developed the paper that I'll be discussing today. Um, uh, we we uh, next visited when I planned to spend the first half of my sabbatical in South Africa in 2020. We spent the first couple of weeks with graduate students at Grown Play and then by ourselves at Cannon Rocks where Becky and I rented a house just down the street from the Viles. It was from this house that the photo of us fishing and this photo of us consuming our spoils in the bottom right were taken. Unfortunately, COVID forced us back to Canada in, in March 2020, and that was the last time I saw Olaf. As Olaf himself would say, well, let's get on with it. So, uh, I want to point out that by no means am I an expert on South, South, America, uh, South African freshwater fi fisheries. My intent today is to present the results of a workshop led by Olaf and many other South African experts, some of whom are in, in attendance today, to develop advice for South Africans. At this point, I would like to acknowledge all of the co-authors of this important paper. Okay, so today uh, I, I will basically be walking you through our our ten questions paper, and you know, again, um, I think most of you know this already, but I wanted to uh, highlight I think the main points in our paper. Uh, the inland fisheries of South uh, South Africa are today have been relatively poorly developed, and have been considered to be missed opportunities for livelihoods development. And there was uh, there is potential for inland fisheries to contribute to the national development plan of 2030 goals of eliminating poverty and reducing inequity. And consultation for a national fisheries policy was initiated in 2016. And in fact, 
that 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 national freshwater inland wild capture fisheries policy for South Africa was published earlier this year. And I just want to give some very high level highlights of that policy uh, as it relates to uh, the presentation. So in this policy, it has the, it identifies that inland fisheries have the potential to contribute to food security, job creation and economic development. And that lack of a national policy has hampered the development of the sector. Uh, and while access to other resources have been sub subjected to democratic era reform, inland fisheries have been overlooked. And the policy is designed to to uh, to align inland fisheries governance with constitutional requirements for a sustainable development approach to natural resource utilization for the benefit of all citizens. Inland fisheries uh, are currently managed in terms of conservation and bio diversity objectives, uh, not, and they're not sufficiently recognized as livelihood opportunities, sources of food security, or as a contributor to the economy. The policy provides for a balance between managing eco ecological sustainability and the social and economic benefits based on a sustainable development approach. <clears throat> now, the purpose of the policy is to support and guide the sustainable development and management of inland fisheries which are recognized as an economic subsector. And uh, it's designed to achieve equitable access to inland fisheries. And, um, and is, is the governance is guided by the constitutional principle of sustainable development and based on uh, FAO's ecosystem approach to fisheries. It takes a precautionary approach to promote sustainable fishing and uh, a value chain approach to maximize the social economic benefits. Now that was the um, the policy in a nutshell, and I would encourage if you, you if you have not already done so to, to read the, the, the actual policy. So back to the 10 questions uh, that were the basis for our workshop at this meeting in 2018 at Cape St. Francis and um, as published in the African Journal of Aquatic Sciences earlier this year. So at the time, the policy was not published and um, Olaf had identified a need to identify a research strategy in support of the impending policy. So we had the workshop and the goal was to develop a consensus based list of priority, priority knowledge requirements for inland fisheries. And uh, uh, at the workshop, there were 15 participants with a broad range of fisheries expertise, mainly South African, but with a couple of uh, foreigners like me and Ian Cox. So I'm going to go through the 10 questions and, and provide the highlights. Uh, so question number one, what is the exploitation potential of inland fisheries? Um, there is a paucity of information on inland fish fisheries that makes answering this question currently very difficult. Um, locality specific data are required in order to um, determine this uh, potential. And that would uh, include the need for baseline surveys to determine the composition and abundance of uh, potential fishery species and um, to be used in in analyses of population dynamics and, and economic viability. And understanding the population dynamics of potential fishery species is fundamental to sustainable development. And, uh, sorry, an image, the, the figure one in our, our paper uh, highlights the need for this locality specific uh, data because when you look at the fishes of South Africa, there are two, mainly two distinct regions. There is the, you know, the, um, the southern temperate high veld eco region, where we have uh, fast growing early maturing species such as Mozambique tilapia. And then for most of the uh, 
sorry, and, and then uh, sorry, that is the Zambezi uh, low uh, low valid eco region, and then uh, and then in, in here, and then in the southern temperate high high valid eco region and Cape Fold eco regions, we have slow growing late maturing species such as cyprinids, uh, and you can see that there's quite a difference in 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 richness of both uh, native. Uh, the gray bars and introduced black bars uh, fish species. What are the health risks from consuming freshwater fish? Is this question number two? Uh, obviously, human induced water quality declines uh, are found in, in urban, mining, industrial, and agricultural areas. Uh, and there are human health risks associated with consumption of contaminated fishes. And, and contaminants are known in popular food fishes such as the African shark catfish and Mozambique tilapia, which increase uh, genotoxic carcinogenic and, and non carcinogenic health risks. And, and studies on these contaminants are limited to a few South African impoundments and river systems. And uh, um, even less is known about zoonotic diseases. Uh, therefore, there's an urgent need for countrywide assessments uh, and, cons and consumption advisories. Question number three, who currently uses inland fisheries and what are their harvests? Um, inland fisheries for food security are often compromised by intense fishing pressure, resulting in reduced catches and the, the uh, eventual depletion of valuable species. There is a need to quantify harvest in relation to potential yield to develop coherent management strategies. Unfortunately, there's virtually no harvest data for inland fisheries in South Africa. And uh, this, this data, such data are essential for the management and national assessment of food security. And there is a, a, a need for a monitoring system for small scale and recreational fisheries. Question four, what can we learn from historical constraints to inland fisheries development? Inland fisheries can, involve, can evolve in sustain, a sustainable manner without compromising food security based on lessons that have learned of, in fact, we, we, we take the time to uh, actually understand the history and, and learn the lessons. Uh, there is a history of failed development of formal small-scale fisheries, uh, such as the one in Lake Garip, where the, the formal fishery collapsed despite infrastructure investments, which, um, you know, um, ironically perhaps led to a successful local informal subsistence fishery of about 80 tons per year, making fish a regular part of the local diet. We need post hoc assessments of such recent fisheries development projects to learn from them. Question five, how will governance of fisheries have to change in an evolving sectorial environment? There's a legacy in South Africa. There's a legacy of lack of rights of access by historically disadvantaged communities to fisheries resources, value chains, and markets. And uh, there is potential competition for water use, for example, for example, for human consumption, agriculture, conservation, and and uh, fisheries. There is a need for a full review of inland fisheries. Um, in, in, in all of those sectors, including the government capacity to manage such fisheries. And um, there is a need to evaluate potential funding mechanisms for developing and managing uh, inland fisheries. And once inland fisheries are established, there is a need to um, conduct research to increase harvest efficiency and enhance economic potential. Question six, what are the options for fisheries enhancement? 
Um, stock enhancement to supplement or replenish wild populations will be necessary. Uh, this will improve rural livelihoods, but it also brings environmental pro problems. For example, negative impacts of stocked species on native species. And the low diversity of South African species throughout most of Southern uh, South Africa, as, as shown in that figure one, limit the options for native fisheries. Non-native species introduced for recreational and subsistence fisheries um, have resulted in imp impacts on native species. And there's a need to identify and culture low impact species. For example, translocated native species or non-reproducing species such as mullet. Need, uh, and there is a need to better understand the ecological costs and economic and social benefits of non-native species. And again, I just want to point out that, you know, the highest diversity of, of uh, fishes are in this Zambesian lowland veld and then the much lower diversity is found in the Southern Temperate and Cape Fold ecoregions. As you can see here, uh, with a very low uh, native uh, diversity. Question seven, what are the most appropriate fisheries technologies? Um, there's a need to identify gears that maximize food security while minimizing ecological and economic impacts. Uh, for example, um, you, there may be a, a, a need to use gears to harvest fish uh, that are smaller than managed in the recreational fisheries in, in order to allow these inland um, subsistence and recreational fisheries to um, sur uh, persist side by side. And uh, you know, many of these gears that would be used in small scale fisheries are prohibited in, in recreational fisheries. So there will there is a need uh, to conduct research on uh, those gears to confirm uh, to to determine their size selectivity and uh, to determine how by, the uh, bycatch can be minimized through mitigation. Question eight, what value chains and employment opportunities are associated with inland fisheries? Uh, South Africa has been developing inland fisheries since the 1960s for rural development and food security. And there is a study based on 35 years of data in the free state that indicates that most operations failed within five years and only two lasted greater than 10 years. And uh, Key take home messages from that study were the, there was the inability to, to fill a, a small quota and to provide full full time employment. Um, the fisheries were of low value and there was no formal market chain to take the fishes to broader markets. More recently, uh, overcapitalization uh, that is the uh, the contribution of uh, funds focused on quick quick fix technological solutions to harvest underutilized and abundant resources, but that combined with an, the um, inadequate understanding of markets and value change has led to failures. However, uh, there are examples of how some small scale fisheries have persisted such as the, the Blumhoff Dam, where um, there is a small scale fishery that fishes largely sh African shark tooth catfish and common carp at the rate of about 210 tons per year. And, and um, this successful fishery has considerable economic multipliers. The local vendors supply local fish and chip shops, making fish available to uh, to the local communities. Regional fishmongers buy one to five tons of fish at a time. And foreign national salt and dry smoke fish for sale in cities uh, and, and in Central Africa. 
And uh, important recreational fisheries are also maintained at the same time. You're, you know, I brought up uh, recreational fisheries several times, and it's important to recognize recreational fisheries as an important value chain as well. Uh, there's an estimated 630,000 freshwater anglers in South Africa. However, the economic impact has not been quantified at the country scale. But, you know, there have been some estimates of numbers at more regional um, uh, scales. Uh, for example, yellowfish fishing on the Val um, brings in an estimated uh, 133 million rand per season. And uh, a small, the small town of Rhodes on the Eastern Cape um, has uh, 13.5 million rand infused into its economy as the result of recreational angling. Uh, so therefore, there is a, a need for a better understanding of economic value and value change of small scale and recreational fisheries. Number, question number nine, what is the impact of water level fluctuations on fish production? Central and northern rivers account for most of the discharge and but in the coastal rivers, uh, are short with seasonal or episodic flows. About half of South Africa's uh, run runoff is stored in reservoirs. However, as we know from recent history, there can be large fluctuations in, uh, in water levels in the re reservoirs as a result of variable flows and high demand for domestic and agricultural use. And uh, those fluctuating water levels will have an impact on fish production. Uh, therefore, estimates of potential yield must account for fluctuating water levels. And uh, sustainable yields must be based on this relationship between water levels and fish production, and, and must consider um, recovery, how, how these fisheries can recover following desiccation to uh, low water levels. And uh, therefore, there is a need to, to understand that relationship and then adapt yields accordingly. And uh, again, just uh, to give you an idea that, you know, most of the discharge in the country is found in the, these, uh, these northern areas of the country. And then the discharges here are seasonal and episodic. And um, here's an example of the relationship between catch, uh, which is uh, the gray bars and water level. And there there's an, it appears to be an inverse relationship between the two, a relationship that we need to better understand in order to manage these fisheries effectively. And this, keep in mind, you know, um, what what should be the, what should be the, how should um, the fishery be managed when when dams are at low levels compared to high levels? How should yields be um, be ad uh, uh, adaptively modified to these varying conditions? Um, these are some key questions uh, related to uh, water levels and fish production. And finally, uh, question ten. What are the impacts of pathogenic diseases uh, on fish populations? Uh, anthropogenic changes to the aquatic environment and translocation of pathogens often result in the disturbance of the natural balance among the environment, susceptible hosts, and the infectious agents, the, the uh, pathogens. And it is, as a result, it's difficult to predict disease events. Uh, and it's particularly difficult because there's a paucity of historical baseline epidemi epidemiological data that compromises the ability to predict disease outbreaks. And uh, the impact, furthermore, that the impacts of diseases on fish populations is largely unknown. Therefore, there's a need to conduct research on the interactions among environmental health, pathogens, and fish health. 
To summarize, our workshop identified 10 key questions that need to be answered uh, to fill gaps in the uh, knowledge required to develop a formal small scale inland fishery sector. The research needs to focus on understanding baseline status and trends in inland fisheries resources, threats to their development, and constraints on their governance. Uh, investment is, is required in primary research, infrastructure, and capacity building. And such investments will provide long-term benefits to optimize resource use, implement the National Freshwater Inland Wild Capture Fisheries Policy, and achieve the South African National Development Plan 2030 goals related to rural e economy and social protection through uh, food security. And at that point, uh, I would I, I, uh, I'd like to just conclude the presentation by making you aware of these two uh, obituaries for Olaf in biological invasions in the Journal of Fish Biology. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, although, again, uh, some of my co-authors may be in, in, in better shape uh, in a better position to, to answer questions. And that with this, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, for that really interesting talk on, on your paper and the tribute to, uh, to your relationship with, with Willow. Any questions from, from anyone in the audience? Doesn't seem like there's uh, any questions. <laughs> so, um, oh, there's a question, I think. I can't see whose hand is up. So, Richard, Richard you can start talking. Hi, Nick. Thank, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering around um, the questions you posed on dam levels or water levels within dams. Um, and in South Africa, essentially a lot of our reservoirs are used um, for storage of water for farming practices. Um, if I have to look at something like or a dam like Glen Alpine Dam in, in Limpopo province, where we, we've done some work there where you get there and it's 100% full and three months later it's been drained down to sort of 0.3% full. It's a little muddy puddle at the, you know, behind the wall. Um, is that going to affect um, setting up fisheries in 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 general, because I th I think in this country as as such agriculture is is seen far more as an important food source as uh, rather than than fisheries. Yeah, yeah, I I I think realistically, uh, you, you know, South Africa will need to determine um, which dams have the potential to have a viable to have viable small scale fisheries, and I think. Uh, if, if the data are collected and the analyses done, then uh, many of these smaller dams will likely just not be feasible uh, uh, locations for small scale fisheries. Uh, particularly, you know, and you, you provide an extreme example where, you know, basically it's it's a put and take water dam, and and it, you know it just it, it's very unlikely that a dam like that would be feasible for um, um, for uh, small scale fisheries unless they were also put and take that it, you know put grow take that is they were used in the short term simply to grow um, fishes that have already been reared for example in a hatchery or elsewhere but uh, fluctu um, widely fluctuating water levels as, such as the one um, that you you mentioned the example you mentioned um, will be uh, a, a huge challenge and, and and realistically in many cases would not be able to support a viable small scale fishery. Why not? And I see another hand up, but I don't see who it is. Uh, Arman, you can go ahead. Hi, Nick. It's it's Victor Weppner here. Um, Perhaps a question to you and um, Leon uh, Barkaisen. 
because um, I, I think you, you you cited or the the, the paper cited his um, his paper um, on the, the fisheries in uh, Lake Kharib. Um, so uh, Lake Kharib, which is our largest impoundment and probably has the highest potential for um, fisheries, um, has this uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, not good reputation of not having a sustainable fisheries. How would one do it differently to to ensure that um, where there's this potential, the potential is actually realized? Uh, hi, Victor, and, and thank you. I, I, I will briefly answer and then I'd be happy to let Leo um, uh, uh, follow up. But, you know, I think again, I think the key is is actually you need the data in order to determine what strategy you could do. And it seems like in the past, based on what I heard at the workshop and what I've heard from Olaf in discussions with him, is that, that these small scale fisheries went ahead without collecting the baseline data to determine uh, what the sustainable yield is. So the, the first step is to actually carry, you know, carry out the research that in support of many of those questions. But if, if Leo is on, I, I'm happy to uh, have him follow up. Thank you, Niklas. Um, I must really thank you very much for giving really such a good presentation on our paper. I think all the authors really appreciate that. Um, to answer Victor's question, um, we are currently having a PhD student, Peter Swanepoel, um, who is currently busy, he's actually finished with all his field work and he will start to write up his PhD. And the main um, end focus of his PhD will be to come up with a fisheries management plan for Harib Dam. So um, hopefully by June next year, Peter will be finished. And then um, he's got, I'm not going to share all that information now, but there's five main focus areas. Um, so he's looking in terms of that now. Um, one thing that I find, uh, because I work very closely in this sector, is currently um, many people are confusing. They see small-scale fisheries as a few people getting gill nets, say nets, a boat, and they go fishing and they start an, in an income. But what COVID-19 has taught us, there is a sudden explosion of subsistence fishermen. Um, we had a case now at Harib Dam where there's a small-scale fishery um, community um, in Fenterstadt that want to harvest on a large scale, but in the same area where we want to operate, there are 205 subsistence fishermen whose livelihoods depend on that, on, on fishing. So th there's so many things to take note of, and we've seen this now at another dam, Kalkfontein Dam, where suddenly people have lost their jobs, they're unemployed, up to 50 people a day sitting next to um, where the Rit River enters the dam fishing. So um, we need to be careful in terms of, do we talk about a small scale fishery with um, 10, 15 people, or do we talk about subsistence fishermen? And, and that's one thing that I try and push through with the people developing or that that's develop a policy because the, there's a long road still ahead because there's still a lot of uncertainties and there's so many things to take note of. So, yeah, I'll stop there, Rava. Thank you. But thanks again, Niklas, for everything. We really appreciate it. Leon, thanks for the very insightful comments. And it, that's interesting about the, the, the influence of COVID on, on, on um, you know, the state of fishery, inland fisheries. And, uh, you know, I'm glad to hear that, that, you know, you are starting to collect those data through your, well, and I think you've been doing it before this most recent PhD student, but it sounds like you're doing exactly what needs to be done in order to collect data to start inform making informed management plans. Uh, so that that's great. Thank you, Leon. Um, yes, there's another question from Matthew Burnett. Matthew, you can go ahead. Yeah, thanks, um, Ben. Thanks, uh, Nicholas, and your yeah, great presentation once again. And I think. Just as a, a concern or interest in the fisheries, um, recently Barbara Creasy from our Department of Environmental Affairs and Tourism published a, or there was an article about her highlighting the importance of the neglected inland freshwater fisheries in South Africa. Um, and, and hopefully that 
kind of produces some traction to to highlight the much needed focus on inland fisheries, um, as you've mentioned, particularly from a government level. But then just also a comment with some of the work we're doing here in KZN and um, with Leon Barkazin's comments particularly is that subsistence fishery does seem to be overlooked, but it's often overlooked because it's hard to to regulate subsistence fisheries into a commercial setup. Um, and yet at the same time, um, our subsistence fisheries, because it's not formalized, it's often not recognized by government because it's informal. And but then also what what really discourages me is that the importance set aside for um, water regulation or water requirements to to give water to people means there's less water in the river. Um, and then secondly, water quality is becoming more well, in the Val, but also in, in the Mgeni catchment to the point where it's actually probably not recommended to eat fish out of the river systems and even in some of the dams. And, and I think just as an early career researcher, my, my worry is that we could, we actually probably looking at saying um, no to fisheries because we need to provide food sources alternatively because of the these other pressing needs and issues within the catchment. And so maybe just you know, some comments around that, but uh, it's concerning as an early career researcher when trying to look at um, promotion of inland fisheries uh, like that. So thanks. Right. And, you know, I, I, I did receive some questions uh, during my World Fisheries Congress talk, and they, a lot of them centered around this um, you know the the water quantity issue and and the, the competing demands for water in South Africa because obviously that made global news and everyone was aware of that. And I think that's a, ma a massive challenge. And you know uh, we have to you know also my view of fisheries management is there has to be pragmatism as well. It's not like we have to go out and collect data for the next twenty years and then decide what we're going to do. I think. We, you know, we really need to take an adaptive approach where, where we make informed decisions, and initially that 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 information may be coming from experts, and then you go as you go out and start collecting data, then you adapt your your management decision making based on the accumulating information, and you know, I I think just about any fishery in, in the world should be managed in this way, and uh, you know. Definitely, your your point about subsistence fisheries and and uh, Leon's point about subsistence fishery that the, that information it's essential that that information is captured in those data in order to make good decisions about um, you know uh, uh, sustainable yield. Uh, so you, you do have a lot of challenges of, ahead of you, and, and more than a country like Canada where you know we don't. We don't have the water quantity issue. We don't have, you know, um, uh, ours is largely just fishing pressure, not not uh, the water quantity issue. But you have com compounding issues. The only way you can move forward is 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 to start, you know, making decisions in, a, in an adaptive management framework. And and while you're doing that, you know, start answering some of these questions by by collecting data. And that will require a substantive investment. In research, in addition to the actual development of the economic side of the fishery as well. Thanks for for that. Um, any other other questions for for Nick or comments? It seems like no other questions or comments. So thank you again, Nick, for for this presentation and and your views and comments on on ways to, to move ahead with some of these questions that you and Willoff and, and the rest of the, the authors has, have posed to the fisheries community in, in South Africa. We really appreciate it. So You're welcome. So, um, so next up is, um, I'm going to hand over to the, the next chair, uh, Josephine Pegg from, from SIAB. Who's going to chair the rest of the session with about eight or nine different presentations from students. Um, so Josephine, if you're ready to, to take over, 
we'll monitor the YouTube and chat box and if there's any questions, so you're free to go ahead. Cool, thank you very much, Vinand. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Cool. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I begin, I just want to say uh, thank you very much, Nick, for uh, such a, a lovely presentation and such a, a lovely tribute to um, Olaf. A lot of us here in uh, this next section are the uh, surviving members of Olaf's lab, the Inland Fisheries and Freshwater Ecology Group. And, um, you know, Nick mentioned that he was a collaborator, um, but he was also a, a dear friend of Olaf, and he has been a, um, a dear friend to the group as well, um, as have many other people here today. So um, before, before I get onto the science, I just wanted to say, um, you know, on behalf of, of our group who are still here, um, thank you so much, um, both for sort of honoring his memory, but also for everybody that has, you know, supported our group's continuation. Um, I noticed yesterday, Vinan, that you said that there were some students presenting who had uh, recently lost their supervisor. And, um, you know, guys, my, my heart goes out to you, but I hope you can find some comfort um, in, you know, seeing the students here presenting today who a year down the line have got some, some really nice uh, science to talk to you about. Um, so on to our, um, our afternoon, um, which is fish biology and ecology. And um, the, the presentations coming up are um, sort of true biology and, um, you know, old fashioned biology and ecology. We've got talks on um, how fish's lives are impacted by their environment um, in terms of growth or spatial use. Um, we've got talks on how fish impact their environment through predation or um, invasion. And then finally, um, we have a couple of talks which are how fish impact people and are of value to people. Um, so I hope you get to watch our YouTube videos, um, but I also hope um, that, that sort of we can give you a, a little taste of, of what the research is about. Um, so I'd like to start with the um, how fish's lives are impacted by their environment. And um, Craig, if you are there from afar, if you'd like to um, just just as and for everybody, just to, to as has gone on before, take uh, a few minutes to, to tell us what your talk is about, please. If you're there, Craig. Cool. Afternoon, Josie and uh, everyone else listening. Um, yeah, thanks. So for my MSc, I was fortunate enough to work on the Kabompo River. Um, I'm sure many of you saw Lomarie's talk uh, yesterday about the system. But yeah, so basically myself and some colleagues from Saib uh, worked on the Kabompo River. This is an extremely understudied um, headwater tributary of the Upper Zambezi with a lot of the work that's been done there restricted to consultant reports. And um, the, yeah, this is under threat from large scale developments from mining and damming projects. But because of the limited literature, we have a very poor understanding of the fish ecology and biology in that area, even the biodiversity. And for my MSc, I looked at, uh, as one of my chapters, um, habitat use of small fishes in uh, MISA habitats along a relatively pristine section of the river. And I looked at five different MISA habitat types. They were bare substrates, phragmites, rocky riffles, in-stream woody debris, and shallow vallis and area patches. And from this, we basically found that Small fish species did show strong associations to specific habitat types, um, as well as certain MISA habitats contained unique species assemblages. And from this, we deduce that there is the potential to use certain species as indicators of environmental change. And if you've seen my presentation, I just make an example of the uh, rocky riffle habitat. Um, yeah, so. There's still a lot of work to be done in, in the region, but we're making small steps. Um, yeah, and further work will hopefully look at degradation gradients and try and uh, find assemblages in pristine versus impacted systems. Uh, yeah, thanks. 
Cool. Thanks, Craig. Um, moving on from Craig's talk, um, I'll I'll tell you about mine. I've got a presentation. I'm chair and presenter, which is weird. But anyway, here we go. Um, I moving on from a sort of a very un, unstudied area to a to an area uh, the Eastern Cape, which which um, obviously is very familiar to us, but to some species which are, are perhaps less studied. Um, I was working on Eastern Cape eels, um, specifically Anguilla, Mozambica, and Marmorata, which is the long fin and the mottled eels. Um, and I was using otoliths um, from eels that had actually been used in a parasitology study, um, but we re reviewed the uh, otoliths to look at uh, growth rates and there were some really interesting findings. Um, firstly, just in terms of numbers of eels when the eels were caught, uh, catch per unit effort was much higher in dams than in rivers. Um, that may be a result of the, the methodology as much as the sort of presence absence. But when we looked at the growth, the growth was growth rate um, was also much higher in dams um, than in rivers, which is um, similar to what's been seen elsewhere in the world. But one of the, the sort of really interesting findings was that the growth rate was um, hugely variable between rivers, um, huge changes, um, even in, you know, um, a relatively small, you know, 100 kilometer um, distances between rivers, there was there was still um, the, these big variations in growth rate. Um, that was in part related to uh, sex ratios with the females growing faster than the males, but um, also, there were obviously other factors um, that was more than just sort of uh, temperature or or such like. Um, we then took our Eastern Cape data and compared the growth rates that we found to recorded growth rates for multiple eel species globally. Um, the thinking being that uh, eels are a species that aren't presently uh, harvested in South Africa to any any real degree, but they are a species um, which is globally very heavily harvested, and and certainly as as sort of northern hemisphere stocks collapse, there there is increasing interest in our southern hemisphere eels. Um, but we compared the the growth rates of um, Anguilla mozambica and Anguilla marmorata to other um, species, and actually our growth rates that, that we were looking for, for these species were comparable to um, Anguilla anguilla, the European eel, and Anguilla rostra, the American eel. Now, both of those are sort of critically endangered. And um, I think it's probably um, could, could be taken as a, a word of caution if we're actually considering um, the exploitation of um, these eels. Um, but I explain more in my video um, if that's of interest. Um, anyway, moving on to the, the sort of next aspect of um, this afternoon talks is how fish um, impact their um, environment. Um, and I'd like to invite Dina, who is here with me in the room, um, to come and take the seat and tell us about uh, her work. Ooh, move over a little bit. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, so my, I'm Dina Mukari and I'm doing masters here at Syab and Rhodes University. So my project was on common carp and uh, the life history of common carp at Hunflay. So the reason for the study site was that Hunflay is a natural lake, a small lake in Western Cape Province. And then this lake currently has um, five non-native species introduced into it and common cup being one of, one of them, which was introduced illegally. And then, uh, so the management authorities of Kunfle, which is Cape Nature, are currently working on employing uh, uh, programs that are harvesting cup out of the system. So my study contributes to this project by providing the biology information of cup. So for this study, we validated uh, the growth analysis on uh, asterisk, asterisk otolith in order to determine the age of carp in the system. So uh, the OTC study started in 2013, whereby um, 
couple injected with OT, with OTC, and then this was used uh, on the current study to validate how many how many annulars form on the OTC. I mean on the OTLIP. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, we found that one uh, one growth annulus form on the OTC every year, and then this information was used to calculate the cup for the current project. And then we found that the oldest cup in the lake was about 20 years old, and then the maturity was reached around two to three years of age, which shows that uh, the cup at Honfle are long lived, and then. We also found that they grow fast between the ages of zero to five years, they reach about 500 millimeter um, of length, which means that cup at home is similar to cup in other invasive regions where it grows fast and then reaches maturity very early and then also reproduces at a young age. Yeah, uh, the findings of the study will be contributing to the current management programs at which aims at having skin cup out of the system. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, Dita. Uh, uh, next up, if you're online, um, I'd like to invite um, Linton, uh, Linton Mun Munyai, um, who's been working on uh, functional responses and additive multiple predator effects predator effects of two common wetland fishes. Um, are you there, Linton? Yes, uh, thank you, Josephine. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Linton uh, Munyai from the University of Venda in the Department of Geography and Environmental Sciences. And my talk today is on functional responses and additive multiple predator effects of two common wetland fishes. I'm a PhD candidate um, from the University of Venda. So I'm basically working at the Kruger National Park, uh, working on the floodplain wetlands of the Kruger National Park. So we try to look on uh, the fish functional responses and uh, the multiple predator effects of these uh, common wetland fishes which are found in these uh, pens. So we use the, the Orochromis mozambicus and uh, Enteromias uh, palidinosus. So from this study, we conducted an experiment where we collected uh, sort of like two juvenile Oreochromis uh, or, or mozambicus and Eteromias palladinosus, where we then had uh, sort of like five experimental treatments of um, single fish species foraging towards uh, or, or feeding towards the Karenomi day prey. Then uh, we further had uh, some conspecific combinations of uh, Oreochromis mozambicus and conspecific uh, of um, Enteromias palidinosus. Then we finally had uh, the interspecific combination just to find out how the interspecific uh, combination will respond. Then uh, we determine we determine the consumption rate of all our treatments, and we also determine the the attack rate. So in terms of consumption rate, we uh, in the results. Uh, if you see, if you've seen my my presentation, I, will, I presented uh, sort of like the results there when uh, consumption rate differed among um, among the, the predator uh, treatments. For example, uh, most of the single Orochromis mozambicus consumed generally a, a greater portion of the available prey or the available carinomid which was supplied, uh, supplied to the treatments than um, than the your, your enteromias palidinosus. However, it was not a significant, it, it, the result didn't uh, differ significantly. Then again, again, when we look at the conspecific pairs of um, uh, of the treatments, we find that uh, Orochromis consumed significantly more than the conspecific pairs of the other species. Uh, then when we look at the interspecific combinations, we find that uh, intersp interspecific pairs of the Orochromis and uh, um, Enteromias consume, consumed more, more prey than those of the conspecific. So those were the results that, um, that, that, that we got from that, that particular study. So uh, in terms of the attack rate, if you have seen the, my presentation also, you would have noticed that um, we had uh, Oreochromis mozambicus ha having a, a, a higher attack rate than, than your uh, Enteromias palidinosus. So basically reflecting the steeper 
uh, a steeper functional response is a slope at uh, at low uh, prey densities. So yeah, that was basically basically what we're doing. And uh, finally, the study suggested the, that the combination of different species of the same sizes uh, exhibited uh, the limited interference when foraging towards uh, the the, 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 the prey or the Karenomi day. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Josephine. Thank you. Yeah, it's a super talk. If anybody hasn't uh, hasn't watched it yet, um, I enjoyed that one. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. And um, yeah, uh, Mbukle, who will be talking later, also is doing doing some similar work. So I hope she's watched it. Um, <laughs> okay, the the next person on on the list is um, another uh, former student of Olaf's, um, who is a, a postdoc now at SIAB. Um, Dumi, are you there? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jesse. Um, so on my talk, so the background of the whole project that I did on my PhD was to look at the distribution of black bass species in South Africa. All of them, large mouth bass, small mouth, spotted and Floridanas, but with specific focus on Florida bass. But Florida bass and largemouth bass, they are similar morphologically. Uh, the only way to differentiate them is through genetics. So most of the work that has been done was to look oh, at um, the use. Okay, so there's some disturbance. <laughs> so most of the work that has been done already in South Africa, looking at the genetics of the two species, were using uh, microsets and CO1. So what we wanted to look at in this particular study was to have a more broader and more information on the genetics of the species, whereby we use single, single nucleotide polymorphism uh, just to look at the amount, how much does um, largemouth bass and Florida bass contribute into the alleles of uh, the species, like looking at the hy hybridization, for example. So we assessed N2 river catchment, which was the Kawi and the breeder. And then what we found was that uh, in the river system, in both river systems, the main stem of the rivers contained hybrid hybrid uh, population. So meaning when you introduce a uh, Florida bus or largemouth bus in the system, you end up having hybrids, not finding any pure population. However, in isolated uh, uh, systems like uh, dams that are away from the main stem, that's where you're likely to find a pure population where you find pure largemouth bus like in the Cow River catchment, we found one population which was like really 100% uh, large mouth bass, which is very important if you want to do some uh, tax, feather taxonomic where you want to look at um, the, the meristic and uh, the looking at the characters, the physical characters of the species. So you'll be able to assess pure species and then you can compare with hybrids and others. So that is very important. And another thing will be to look to, div to devise management strategies of the species, because the two species, largemouth bass and Florida bass, they differ in like uh, their physiological tolerances, thermal, for example. So if we know where each of the species is found in South Africa, then we'll be able to manage them. Yeah, so that's basically what we're doing in this uh, study that I presented. Thank you. Cool, thank you very much, Dumi. Okay, um, the next uh, person I'd like to introduce is Mbukle Panza, who's here with me also. Um, good day, everyone. My name is Mbukle Panza, an MSc from Sayab and Rhodes University. So my research looked at the age and growth of Orochromis mozambicus in the Sundays River catchment using cytosol alternates, um, which was then compared with um, that of Orochromis nanoticus based on literature. 
So in order to develop sustainable management strategies for Oropomis Mozambiques, which is at the risk of extension due to hybridization, trophic overlap as well as habitat overlap with the invasive Oropomis um, nanoticus, a proper understanding of their age and growth um, is needed. And hence our hope with this research is to better understand factors driving invasion and establishment of the invasive night tilapia within the context of its impacts on Oropomis uh, Mozambiques and then eventually better manage um, Oropromis Mozambiques in the East Africa. So we looked at age um, specific differences um, in growth, which have found that males grow faster than the females. And then when we're looking at the overall population of Oropromis Mozambiques, we found that there was an initial growth um, until four years old. And then eventually thereafter, there was a decrease in growth as they approach um, first maturity. And then um, when we compared the overall population growth of Orochromis mozambicus with that of Orochromis naloticus, we found that Orochromis naloticus had faster growth than Orochromis mozambicus, and this was based on literature for Orochromis naloticus. So these results are crucial in predicting the potential impacts of Orochromis naloticus in the Eastern Cape, if it was to be introduced in this region, as well as assisting in the implementation of management strategies for Orochromis uh, mozambicus in the Eastern Cape. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nipotla. I know that uh, Nipotla has got some questions on her YouTube, but if we, um, if I can introduce my speakers first and then we'll, we'll come to questions afterwards. Um, so those guys were the sort of how, how fish their impact their environment uh, section. And uh, the final two speakers um, I'd like to introduce their, their work to um, are working on in this sort of area of um, how fish um, impact people and are, are of value to people and are, are impacted by people. Um, so if I can get uh, Manetsi to come, come join me, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Manetsi, um, who is our a uh, brand new um, graduate with his new PhD. So um, tell us about your work, please, sir. Yeah, shut up a bit. Okay. I can see you. There you are. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Muneti Zawaira. I'm a PhD student at uh, University of Fort Hare and also hosted by South African Institute of Aquatic Biodiversity. So my talk uh, is on population size and biomass of estuarine round area uh, in the Sandy's river irrigation ponds. Basically, we are assessing the potential for harvesting. So with a background of increasing um, food insecurity across the world, uh, there has been an increase in the um, uh, utilization of small fish species that are less than 20 centimeters when mature uh, in many developing nations, uh, such as uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, just to mention a few, uh, to address uh, food uh, insecurity and uh, nutrient deficiency. Uh, however, generally this is uh, missing in South African inland uh, fisheries. So, uh, Despite having a uh, species like Dilcrisella estuaria, which is predominantly an estuarine species, but has been introduced in freshwater systems um, uh, by two means. First, uh, firstly, it was uh, introduced deliberately uh, as fodder for angling species. Then it was also introduced in freshwater systems uh, through inter basin water transfer schemes. And this species has, however, managed to produce uh, self-sustaining populations. So in this uh, uh, approach, um, in this um, work, we tried to uh, determine the, the population size and biomass using depletion experiments uh, in the Sandy's uh, river uh, ponds. And uh, our findings were that uh, we found that Geocrisella estuaria was um, the most dominating species, uh, both numerically and uh, biomass. Uh, however, the biomass uh, seemed to be too low to sustain a commercial uh, fishery. 
but can uh, can uh, be used to uh, supplement uh, diets, especially for the rural poor people who cannot afford expensive uh, foods. And uh, furthermore, we also found that there was no correlation between um, uh, pond size and uh, and biomass uh, per hectare. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manatsi. Our final um, YouTube video and speaker in this group is um, also a lab member, uh, Hima. Um, are you there, please? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, my name is Hima. I'm um, an MSc student at Fitz University, also in partnership with the South African Institute of Aquatic Biodiversity. Um, my study, uh, we, my study was conducted in Lake Nyasa or Lake Malawi, which is um, a transboundary lake that's a critical resource to three countries, which is Malawi, Mozambique, and all three of which are developing countries. Um, so we focused, we, what we did was we put um, baited remote underwater video systems or BRAVs in uh, different areas of, of um, a part of the lake in Mozambique so that we could see um, if we could use them to get critical population data about a, uh, about a small species, Metroclima isterae, um, critical to the aquarium trade and also brings in some income through ecotourism. Um, so the aim was to see if we could use BRAVs to monitor smaller species in the lake. Um, we found that the abundance of the species was mainly driven by the substrate. Um, we looked at habitat preference and the associated abundance. So we found that the abundance of the species was mainly driven by um, the substrate. Um, we, and we also found that males and females of the species exploited slightly different niches. So um, the females are bright yellow color. They seem to, um, both males and females preferred rocky habitats, but the females, which are bright yellow color, um, seem to be confined to the rocky habitats, whereas the males were found in sandier habitats. Um, this is because the, of the color difference, so they're sexually dimorphic. Um, the females are yellow, the males are blue, so they're more likely to blend, blend in and be less conspicuous to predators. Um, we also found that males were more abundant than females. Um, they, this could be because of two reasons. Um, one is because the males are more generalist and tend to exploit more uh, a wider range of habitats. Um, they're less um, they're less likely to be threatened by habitat degradation. So um, there's a lot. Uh, the rocky habitats are become over, becoming overlain with sand because of industrial development on the banks of the lake. Um, so the males are obviously less because they can use a wider range of habitats, whereas the females are confined to it and and um, are declining in number because of the um, habitat preference. And then the other reason could also be because the females are more sought after in the aquarium trade because of their bright color. Um, so we found that the bruvs were actually effective in collecting the population data and um, they gave us viable information that can be used to underpin the management and conservation of the species and other similar to it in the lake. Um, yeah, and that's basically all my project. <laughs> that's great. Thank you very much, Hima. Um, and if anybody's a bit tired of listening to us talking, um, I recommend Hema's presentation. You don't even, well, I recommend listening to it, but if you've had enough, just, just look at the beautiful um, imagery. She's got some, some great underwater uh, video shots um, in that talk. So um, that's a, an introduction to uh, the, the eight of us that comprise this afternoon's um, talks. Uh, sort of as a reminder, uh, Craig was talking about small fish communities in the Kabompo River as indicators. Um, I was talking about uh, age and growth in the eels. Um, then we had Dina, who's been studying um, invasive carp in Hrunfle. Linton, who's been looking at um, combined uh, predator functional responses. Dumi, um, hybridization between invasive uh, basses. And uh, Nabuchle, who's been studying the age and growth of Orochromis mozambicus. 
And then finally, we had um, Manazzi with his um, exploitation of Gil Cristella and Hema's um, underwater baited cameras in Lake Nyasa. Um, would anybody, uh, I'll open the floor to any questions from anybody out there. Um, Vinand, have we got any on the um, uh, on the YouTube? Uh, Leon, Leon has a question. Leon, how are you doing? Good afternoon, sir. Hi, Josie, final self. Uh, my question is to Dinah. Um, the current eradication control programs in Groenvlei, um, trying to get rid of the car. Um, can you detect a decline in the population at this stage or not really? So there hasn't been a formal uh, study to look at the effect of the eradication efforts, but uh, they think it might be decreasing. Uh, I'm not sure myself because I haven't really looked at carpet conflict before 2020. Yeah, it's it's a difficult one, Leon. Um, the the there was, I mean, there was a huge huge number in there, um, but they have really sort of ramped up the removal um, efforts. Um, we're quite interested in the the sort of the age and, and growth because um, obviously, if they if they're taking out enough that it is impacting numbers, um, we think there might be a sort of compensatory uh, growth effect. Um, but we're not we're not quite at the point now. I mean, the, the really sort of extreme removal efforts have only been the last um, sort of three years, um, particularly sort of the last year. Um, but I think, um, you know, perhaps sort of next year and the year after we'll, we'll be able to uh, revisit our sort of experimental nettings and um, report on that. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yes, thanks. Cool. Thanks, Leo. Can I maybe just ask a follow-up question? I mean, Grunfly, I assume, is in the in the um, national park down there. And is it is there any fishing, recreational fisheries there, or is it purely just you know, there's no fishing allowed? No, uh, fishing is allowed at Grunfly. The th the thing about Grunfly is it's not really much accessible, so it's surrounded by reeds all around it. But then people with boats do go and do recreational fishing. There was a bass fishing which used to take place, I think, every year with tournaments taking place. But right now, it's not taking place anymore because uh, there's more carp compared to bass. And people trying to catch bass, they actually find more carp. Now, yeah, I was just wondering if there's been a pushback from the recreational fishers to, to stop the removal of a carp or from the yeah. system. because. It's what they would lack in the system. Not much on the cup removal because they are more focused on bus and they are actually worried about not finding bus. Uh, yeah, so the cup fishers are not as much compared to the bus fishers at Conflict. Okay, thanks. But I don't if I could just add to that, it's quite interesting because you've got at Conflict both uh, sort of recreational people and um, Sort of again low level uh sort of local consumptive fishing and there, there are a small number of, of carp anglers who obviously like like their carp fishing but both the the sort of sport bass men um and and the sort of local folks that sort of take fish to take there um really aren't that into the to the carp and, and there's there is quite a lot of overall there's more sort of support for the removal than that there is um, voices against it Although there's always sort of a, a vocal minority. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I'm just so in terms of a carp picking up. So, was there any ecosystem effects? You know, increased turbidity and those sort of things that inhibited the, the especially the bass, probably. So. Yeah. Uh, so I managed to see pictures of Kumfle before carp was introduced because they say it was introduced illegally in 1991 or something. There. So, I mean, Hrumfle used to just be clear where you can see from a picture taken above, you can see all the way into the lake. But then currently the lake is very too big. It's green to brown with, yeah, 
it's hard to see. So its turbidity increased a lot. And then the microphytes that were also in the water are actually decreasing. Okay, cool. Na nice work. Thank you. Leo, is your hand still up or is that just from before? No, um, I've got a question, maybe a comment on your eels um, um, research. Um, we are currently doing fish surveys in um, 17 river systems in the Free State, and obviously you do some literature research, and I discovered that in the Tierpoort River, that's plus minus 50 kilometers from Bluefontein, in 1972, they found two Angela Mozambikas there. And also at Harib Dam, um, I don't know if you're aware about that, they've also found, I think, below the dam wall and even in the dam, also eels. Did you also come across that, or how do you think they got there? So they can travel um, thousands of kilometers. There's, um, they, they, it was, they were probably, they probably got there by themselves. Um, with regards to sort of getting the oversight, other side of the, the dam, certainly when they're, you know, very small, they can, they can climb sort of basically vertical surfaces and, and, you know, go, go around on, on wet grass and, um, their capacity to move upstream is quite spectacular. It's, it's unfortunately the sort of down, downstream um, migrations that are really prevented by the dams because the, the large eels, once they sort of exceed um, a certain weight, are, are then um, sort of prevented from moving downstream. Um, so sort of uh, Bloom and, and Harif actually, you know, it's, it's a, a heck of a long way to have come. Um, whether, you know, where, I mean, that, I suppose there's always a possibility that they were moved, everything, you know, can be moved, but, um, you, you know, there's, there's certainly records of them, you know, traveling enormous distances, so it's not unfeasible. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Leon. Uh, there was another hand up then, and I missed who it was. Um, I, I think it's a hand from Ryan, Vassaman. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Yeah, um, it would be really interesting. I think Leon was um, alluding to the fact that um, naturally the angulids don't occur in the Vaal or not thought to occur in the Vaal and Orange system because they enter into the ocean off the west coast of South Africa. But um, it would be interesting to to have a look at if the eels are making it across the watershed into that system using interbasin transfers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I can't tell you that. Um, I, I know about our Eastern Cape guys, but, um, you know, it's, it's certainly not un, unfeasible that that could happen. And, and as I say, you know, when they're small, they can, they can cover Sort of insane distances so but then they are also quite mobile you know they are an animal that will um sort of stay alive basically in a, a you know a damp sack so um they are they are an easily moved by people species too uh, thank you yeah now that's a really cool question uh is there any more questions out there uh I think there's one or two questions from from YouTube for uh, for Buchle, um on if I can just find the questions. So she said that male fish grew faster than females. Does she have any reason uh, for, for that? And then was there any correlation between growth and age in a, in a study? Uh, thank you. So for the correlation between age and growth, um, for in our adults, we noticed the growth, initial rapid growth from zero until four years. And then after that, there was a reduction in growth as they started to approach first maturity. And then when we look at the males being larger than females, this is mainly um, related to their spawning behavior. Males are known to be aggressive territorial spawners because they need to defend um, their spawning grounds. Yeah, that's about it, mainly. No, cool. I, I also just have a question on, I mean, did you look at these Orochromus mozambicus to ensure that pure strain Orochromus mozambicus, um, or if there's already been some introductions of Nilotikus in the system, um, and there's been hybridization or 
or did not, was it outside the scope maybe of your work? Oh, I, I, we did not look at Oropromis Nanoticus. So Oropromis Nanoticus was only based, the, um, the data that we have for Oropromis Nanoticus was based on literature. So the only um, species that we worked with was Oropromis Mozambicus. And then once we had that, we related everything based on literature to Oropromis um, Nanoticus. And no, Oropromis Nanoticus has not yet been introduced in the Eastern Cape because my study was in the Eastern Cape. Okay. That's good to hear. Hopefully it remains that way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is there is there any more is there any more questions um, for for any anyone here? Um, I see there's a question in the chat from Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Um, hi all, I would like to know whether Oreochromis um, lidole still occurs in the river lake systems in Malawi or surrounds. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't know whether there is anybody on, uh, anybody else on here that might be able to help Sandra. Yeah, no, unfortunately I don't know as well. So. Um... Sandra, okay, your question, your question's there in the chat. So um, if anybody, if anybody wants to to get in touch, um, yes, no, sorry, that's a, a no to that to that one. Um, okay, it's now what are we on three o'clock. Um, Vinand, um, I know we've we've got we've got the eight people here and. Um, I've, I've had a bit of a chat chat with a group about questions. I don't want to just ask them difficult questions for the sake of, of taking out time. But um, obviously, as we are um, Olaf's group, sorry, Linton, this is a surprise for you, but um, you sound like a smart chap, so I'm sure you can cope with it. <laughs> um, I, I asked the, the, the sort of the members, the members of, as, as we're Olaf's group, um, Olaf was, was a big fan of this sort of basic um biology and ecology but he, he also sort of was always encouraging us to um make our work applied and and useful that was sort of really at the, the heart of his ethos um so i have asked all my group to um have a little bit of a think about um how their work is is a, a sort of a of what's the impact of, of their little presentation um and how does it sort of fall into um you know that the the questions that nick was was talking about this morning that the value of fisheries and the the use of, of fish and and fisheries so um if we've got if we've got a little bit of time and you know if anybody asks any questions we can we can come back to your questions but if i could just get my group um to to just give us a, a really quick um so impact statement of their work um i'll start with the the senior ones and, and work back. So do me if you're still there. Um, I know this is something you're pretty passionate about. So um, could you could you tell us your bit, please? <laughs> Have you got? Uh, no, you're still there. Okay. No, I'm around. Uh, yeah. So so most of my work um, and what I've been doing a lot was to work with the sunbee in like a uh, risk assessment of alien invasive species in South Africa. Uh, so for this project was to, it also contribute in when we're coming to food security, because we know uh, bears are apex predators, they, are, they have top-down control on the food webs. So if we know what they feed on and how is their feeding rate and um, which species of bears is being introduced in South Africa, how is that species going to have impact on our natural ecosystem, then we can be able to manage them and develop measures that are more aligned. Because some of uh, the best species are introduced in areas where we find a lot of uh, native endangered species. Like, for example, in the Cape Foiled ecoregion, where most of the endemic species are endangered. So, if we know how to 
develop measures to manage the species, then it will be very in informative and it will also help in food security and the management of the non-native species. That's basically where my work fits into the, the South African policies that are yeah, environmental policies. Awesome. Thank you, Debbie. Thank um, you. Betsy, yeah. Do you want to come and, and tell us? Um, so basically, my research um, was attempting to um, address uh, how uh, these small fish species can address um, uh, some of the SDGs, such as uh, zero anger. Uh, especially in the in the in the rural South Africa, where there is uh, increasing uh, food insecurity, and um, besides that, the research is also addressing one of the questions that were mentioned earlier on by Nicholas, uh, such as um, um, determining the production potential before we can even attempt to harvest the fish. So basically we realize that uh, it's not feasible to have a commercial uh, fishery, but just enough to sustain, um, I mean, just enough to supplement uh, at, at a very low level uh, in the rural uh, communities. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Vanetzi. Um, I see we have got a question here in the, in the questions. So um, if I can get, uh, Craig, if you can come back to us, um, you're there. Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so I'll I'll get you to if you can answer your question, um, and then I'll get you to to tell us about the the impact of your work. But your question from uh, Christopher Curtis is: Craig, is there any direct evidence of water quality impacts from, for example, mining that might impact fish communities in the Kabompo River? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. So, a short answer is no. Um, yeah, basically, where we sampled was quite far downstream from the mining activities. Um, and yeah, those guys seem quite protective um, around the mining areas. It's normally big gated areas with controlled access and stuff like that. But you know, in the future, we'd really like to go and assess something like that, look at the real impacts of these mines. Because if you just look on Google Earth, for example, you can see one of the main tributaries that flows out of the mine um, is extremely turbid compared to the, the other systems. So there's definitely going to be an impact um, of the water quality on, on the species. Um, yeah, it would also be great if a lot of the consultant reports, which I assume have been done in some of these places, are actually made public available, publicly available. Um, yeah, because it's been quite difficult to find literature on the region. Um, yeah, basically, even the consultants don't want to share what they have. So yeah, it's been it's been tough. Cool. Thank you very uh, much, Craig. And do you want to tell tell us about your impact and your your value of your work? Sell it. <laughs> So yeah, although I'm not working in South Africa, um, yeah, the Upper Zambezi represents one of the most important fisheries in uh, Southern Africa. Although in the Kabompo, the fishery is a bit, well, quite a bit smaller than places like in the Barotse lands or the floodplains or the Caprivi. Um, a lot of subsistence communities really rely on on those fishes and harvesting a diversity of fishes, not only the large cichlids and the, the tiger fish, but a lot of those small enteromia species um, cyanodontis and things like that. And yeah, when these large corporations come in and degrade the system, often there's no baseline information for it. So you only arrive there and we know what's not there anymore as opposed to what used to be there and is now gone. So basically by conducting these kind of preliminary assessments in pristine areas, we can infer what impacts these major developments might have on the system. And try and mitigate and control against these. Um, yeah, also there's a lot of people like to put things where they shouldn't be. Um, now tilapia are quite abundant in the system already. And yeah, we need to try and see how they fit into the picture. Um, yeah, as well as the Australian red claw crayfish. 
although not present in the Kabompo yet, they'll be there in a few years' time. So we really need to try and understand how the system is working and who lives where while it's still relatively unaltered. Um, yeah, thanks. Cool, thank you, Craig. Um, Dina, the Butler? Dina, you come up first. <laughs> Okay, hi again, everyone. So in terms of the impact of my research, so first of all, on the research part of it into science contribution. So uh, the biology of carp in South Africa is not well studied. And then my research is one of the few studies that validated uh, the growth formation of carp in South Africa. So that's a contribution into science. And then in terms of the social part of it, so this project started a while ago, and then interviews were conducted on people in the local area of with a search field where Hunfle is. And then in order to find out if there will be conflict when cup is removed from the system and whether people eat cup or not at Hunfle. So my research will be um, important when decisions of removing cup entirely in the long run are made. Yeah. Thank you, Dina. Actually, as, as Dina mentioned, this is this is where one of the things that came out of this study that was really interesting. Um, the the only sort of previous uh, age growth validation for carp in South Africa was done in um, Harip, and um, in that study there were uh, two um, annular rings, uh, sorry, two rings um, on the otolith per year. Um, in our study for the carp, we only found a, a sort of single, single um, annulus. So if anybody is, is uh, interested in studying carp, um, you know, we've got two not actually that far away from each other systems where we've got really sort of different um, sort of growth patterns. So uh, be, be wary of that because we were quite surprised by that result. Um, it certainly wasn't the same as the only other, only other carp growth study here. Um, yeah, do you want to carry on and come back? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add to just this part about <laughs> that. Uh, so, cub on the previous study in South Africa were found to grow up to seven years, and then the whole play one were actually very different in that the, uh, the largest cub was 10 years old. So, I think that was a very interesting yeah. finding in the study. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Not much is known about carp, but they, they certainly do strange things in strange places. Uh, Nabokle, is there anything else you'd like to add? No. Okay, Nabokle is at the back. <laughs> um, just checking we've got no questions before we carry on. Uh, Linton, uh, are you still there? Do you do you want to have a uh, join join the team if you'd like um, to talk about the sort of impact of your work, if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, thanks, Josephine. Um, I think we, we, as we are, we are working on the Makuleke wetlands uh, system, the flat plain systems. So the impact of this work, we thought is, is, is very much important actually to try to understand how the, 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 the uh, so that we can, uh, to understand the trophic interaction, because the, you know, understanding trophic interaction is, is very much essential for the prediction and, uh, measuring the structure and function of the the, the, the aquatic systems or the or wetland systems uh, per se and how the uh, the the predator and prey interactions are really functioning in this uh, wetland system uh, which can actually have a significant consequences on the again on the structure and the the the, the entire dynamics of, of of the ecological communities or the fish species that are uh, or that occurs um in in those particular uh, systems and again remember it could actually have a destabilizing effect or the predators can have a destabilizing effect on the resource uh, that are present in those uh, tropical wetlands so i think it was very much important for us to undertake this study so that we can actually understand the dynamics of uh, the predator predator interactions predator and prey interactions and uh, and lastly, using the functional responses as an approach. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 also, it's, it's also a tick, especially in, in using it in the flat, uh, in the floodplain wetland uh, systems. So yeah, so that is the, the impact that uh, I, I can say. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Actually, one of us now. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> 
<laughs> I'm uh, in. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Uh, Hema, uh, you're, you're the last person on my list. Is there anything uh, you'd like to, to add about your work? Um, yeah, I think I think for mine, because like Lake Nasa, like Malawi is, is um, a very famous lake because of the amount of different freshwater fish species lives in it. it the impact of my study is um, pretty obvious because we focused on the anthropogenic, um, uh, I guess, value, I, the value of the fish to the people, to put simply. So I think, I mean, it's also, it's the fish, though we may not have focused on a fish that, that is caught and eaten, um, the fish also, it, the species brings in um, income to the country through the aquarium trade, through ecotourism. And it's also part of um, the Mabuna, which are a group of fish, fish which um, uh, contribute to the national natural um, heritage of the lake. Like the lake is considered a natural heritage site because of, of some of these fish species. And it's also, um, I think it's also, they also like part of the cultural um, heritage of of the lake, so I think that's also quite important, though they may not be caught to be eaten, um, and also just in terms of biodiversity, because the lake is a biodiversity hotspot. Um, the the these there's many different species, and the research, though we focused on one species, can be applied to a number of different species that are similar to. So yeah, <laughs> that's what I think. Cool. Thank you so much, Hiva. Um, okay, I'm just having a look at the chat and I can't see any more questions. Um, is there is there anyone out there that, that wants to ask um, any any of this group speakers? Um, yeah. Doesn't look like there's any, any questions. Oh, it's it's a uh, we've had a long session for for. Yeah. For the eight of us, Finant. <laughs> it's been it's been a really interesting session and a great that you you shared a bit of um, Willoff's ethos and, and focusing on the biology, but actually making your work impactful, even if you're doing basic research and always to think about the bigger picture. So I think that's been really, really amazing. Um, is, I think there's a final hand from Richard. Um, hi Josie. Um, I just thought um, with regards to this session as well and, and Olaf's ethos and his his drive to, to get the society um, as members of the American Fisheries Society, um, we we are looking at joining the, the World Council of Fisheries Societies as well. I had a meeting with them the other day and um, the American Fisheries Society has offered us two places for for students to attend um, their conference 6th to 10th. So I just wondered if you wanted to mention those two students that you've selected to to attend that that conference as well. Yes, yeah, so um, two two students um, from um, the Olaf's, Olaf's lab, the Inland Fisheries and Freshwater Ecology Group um, are going to be representing South Africa at the American Fisheries Society. Um, thank you so much for giving them the opportunity. Um, the two students who are going are um, Manetsi Zabahera, who you've um, heard from uh, this afternoon. Um, Manetsi has, as, as I said, just just uh, completed his PhD. So um, instead of uh, sitting around in his uh, pajamas watching Squid Game, he is he is <laughs> off to. Um, off virtually uh, to the States to keep expanding his horizons. And um, the second student, uh, Mohamed Kaji, who is presenting live tomorrow, um, is uh, our, our second candidate. Um, Mo is a sort of a special member of Olaf's group as he was the last uh, student uh, taken on by Olaf prior to his death. Um, so they're both uh, both got really interesting work. You've heard uh, um, Manetsi today and, and you'll hear from, from Mo tomorrow, but um, we as a group are, are very proud of them and, and we're um, yeah, very, very grateful um, to SASEX and to, to AFS um, for supporting them. Um, most of our group are members of 
um, AFS, it's only $10 a year. Um, and uh, we, we have, I was at their virtual conference last year and, and they do a lot of really good meetings. So um, if anybody is on the fence for, for $10, um, it's actually a very good investment. Um, and their international section is, is quite active and they, they have um, some lovely travel grants actually in memory of Olaf. So uh, when we can move again, um, hopefully next year and go to live conferences, um, they do, they do have, it's, it's called the OLAF um, travel grant, which, which does sponsor um, people from uh, low and middle income countries. So um, yeah, um, Olaf was, was a, a big um, supporter of the American Fishery Society. And um, I think there are, there are good reasons why Olaf knew what he was doing, but um, yeah, that's, so thank you uh, for those two being supported. No. It's, it's great that he and hopefully as Sussex we can continue working together with AFS going forward and exchange ideas and and keep the connection that will have started alive and and well going into the future so yes so I think we've we've come to the end of this this session um I think that no other questions and it's been really a, a nice session so thank you to the, all the presenters uh for to Josephine for for chairing such a a lovely session at the end, uh, often a difficult session at, at conferences um, and probably even more difficult virtually where people's attention uh, can drift away and no one will even notice. So so thank you very much for, for you and for all the presenters for keeping it interesting and um, engaging throughout the, the time. <coughs> so that brings us to the end of, um, let me switch on my video. So everyone can see I'm still around and not sleeping. So that brings us to the end of the Microsoft Teams session for today. We will continue with this tomorrow morning at nine o'clock with um, live video showings of um, freshwater biodiversity information system and a few, one or two of our students and then a few other sessions on estuarine ecology and some general talks towards the end of the day. Coming up now at four o'clock, so there's a, a nice break to just stretch your legs. And if, for those of you that have registered for the, the Sussex medal ceremony, um, it will be on the Zoom links that I've shared. So please, if you haven't registered, I think you, you can still register and, and join us at, at four o'clock for presentations of, of bronze and, and gold medals. Um, and uh, we'll also jo join live presentation of some of these medals at, at SIAB there down in Makanda. So thank you very much for attending day two of, of the Sussex conference. For those of you, we'll see you in 40 minutes. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Um, the meeting will open at about half past eight and then we'll start at nine o'clock. So thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Ryan.